questions or any remarks that you may have in the chat, uh, Wilke will monitor that uh, and feel free to ask any questions you'd like. We will be um, answering them at the end of the talk just because it's easier for us to do it that way so that we don't uh, have to uh, keep track of the chat all the time. Um, my name is Janine Felix. I am Associate Professor in Pediatric Epigenetic Epidemiology at Erasmus MC in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and I lead the um, JPI uh, HDHL funded uh, Nutri Program project. Um, I'm here together, as you can see, with Professor Mario Ritayal Belin, um, uh, who's Professor and Chair of Life Course Epidemiology at Imperial College London in the UK, as well as Professor at Brunel University and the University of Oulu in Finland, where she is the scientific director of the Northern Finland birth cohorts. And very importantly for today, she leads the PRECISE consortium, which is also funded by JPI HDHL. And in fact, both projects, so Nutri Program and, um, and PRECISE, uh, are very much focused on the role of early life nutrition and nutrition related factors, how they affect later life health and potential underlying biological pathways. So we're working very closely together um, through these projects, through many other projects for, for many years now, um, in trying to better understand how these early life factors, how and why they relate to um, later life health. So um, I could go on about this for hours, but given the short time that we have, um, we're going to give you a very brief overview of um, the field that we work in, um, what's been going on before, where we are now, and some thoughts for uh, the future, and hope that we can convey to you why we think this is such an exciting area. So um, without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Marjorie Tal. Thank you, Janine, for your kind introduction, and uh, thank you, GPI, for um, having us here. Uh, the timeline here shows, in a nutshell, where the science has taken us uh, by now, and introduces some key stages of research on early development and health by previous researcher generations and by us. I would like to start uh, by freely quoting uh, Taylor Coldridge's statement that the history of man uh, for the nine months preceding his birth would probably be far more interesting than all the 70 years that follow it. This novel note is said to be from 1802. Already from the 19th century, there were quite a lot of useful maternal and child mortality data that were a basis for forthcoming early scientific research. In those days, 30% uh, of children died by the age of five and 50% before the 15th birthday. These data are mainly from uh, Western societies from the UK and the US. In early 19th century, the importance of um, um, mat maternity care and nutrition, maternal nutrition, was acknowledged, leading to research and multiple actions in healthcare. One interesting proposition was uh, the cutoff of uh, 2,500 grams for low birth weight by Finnish pediatrician. That was later approved by um, American Association of Pediatrics to facilitate comparison between the studies and is still being used 100 years later. Much of the research during the first um, half of 20th century, I would say until 1960s, focused on how child was thriving, uh, what was his or her, her nutritional status and weight and height measurements became a common practice in healthcare. But all along, family social circumstances were equally important in 1930s, 40s and thereafter in the research. The research on a biological determinant of fetal growth also gradually started uh, using human and animal data, especially from the 1960s, using the current day, quite current day methods in research. These have shown uh, the important associations of uh, maternal nutrition, uh, maternal smoking, pesticide exposure, gestational diabetes and hypertensive disorders with uh, fetal growth and child's later develop development. 
It is of interest uh, that, for example, gestational diabetes was very rare in many populations in 1960s, 70s, and so on, contrary to current day, while hypertensive disorders uh, were more often observed, showing quite stable incidences, and nowadays even decreasing incidences. The research on the association between birth weight and uh, chronic communicable diseases started somehow incidentally when the first data uh, came from uh, Norway in late 1970s and then in the UK mid 1980s, showing the association between infant mortality and ischemic heart disease. Poor living circumstances and poor nutrition, early nutrition, were thought to be a uh, possible reasons. Since then, thousands of papers have been published. Much of the research until 1990s were, was based on observational association data. The important change happened when large-scale candidate gene uh, genotyping became uh, possible and affordable in late 1990s, especially in early 2000 in this research field and leading eventually to extensive genome-wide association studies, GWOSIS, landmarked from 2007 onwards at larger scale. Our teams, Janine, Janine's and mine, also joined in these efforts, and the Northern Finland birth cohort 1966 being the very first birth cohort generating GWOS data. This led us to explore whether multiple associations between birth weight, uh, prenatal uh, growth and adult diseases disorders may be explained by shared genotypes, and some do indeed. However, much is still unanswered and great interest uh, has been on what are the mechanisms behind uh, the observed associations. To this question is uh, very complicated as multiple factors interplay, but uh, genetic modifications have been suggested and put forward as one possible mechanism. During the past 10 years, generation of uh, genome-wide um, genetic data, eWash data, has become affordable and led to many new discoveries for example, concerning maternal smoking and later disorders, and what might be the mechanisms. These efforts have importantly supported by GPI program now, have given us a lot of opportunity. Having all these data and beyond on our tables, the key question is that, what are the potential causal pathways? and that if we can identify the critical developmental windows beyond pregnancy as targets for health promotion. These works are being advanced uh, by um, development of analytical tools that can utilize a life course data and multi multiple birth cohort data sets created by now, and also by the use of um, uh, genetic data to distill potential causal pathways and mechanisms. Now I will pass this uh, to Janine for the facts. <laughs> Thank you very much, Margarita, for that wonderful setting the stage for where we are now. Um, I w just realized right before this talk that you cannot see my pointer, so I will just um, show you the slides. You see here on the left side, as Margarita has mentioned, that there are many um, factors in early life during pregnancy that can affect the health of the offspring. You can think about strong effects such as smoking, um, uh, folate intake or folic acid intake, air pollution, but also maternal obesity, uh, physical activity, um, maternal gestational diabetes or other nutritional factors that are more specific. Um, and we know from observational studies that these are associated with many different health outcomes, including heart disease, lung disease, mental health, as well as obesity. 
What we're currently interested in, which I would like to tell you a little bit more about, is why. We're trying to figure out how these are connected. And one of the me mechanisms that I will focus on today, or actually the only mechanism that I will focus on today, is um, DNA methylation, which we consider a promising mechanism in this field. So you can see that a little bit here without going into too much detail. Basically, what DNA methylation is, is the attachment of a methyl group, so a molecule, to the DNA that makes the DNA more or less accessible to be used. So I always like to see it sort of as a, as a cookbook, maybe the DNA is a cookbook with all the recipes for all, your, all the functions in the body. It, it tells the body how to work. And by putting post-its in it, um, like these methyl groups, you can make certain recipes more active and more likely to be used as compared to others. And this is important because um, you can understand that not all genes need to be active at all times in the development. For example, in early life, you have to do a lot of growing. Uh, but of course, if you're 60, you don't have to do that much growing anymore. You need to do um, other functions. So you can see how certain parts of the genome need to be uh, more active in one stage and maybe not so active in another stage. So that's where DNA methylation comes in as one of the mechanisms to regulate that. And what we want to explore is if it's indeed the case that these early life factors affect DNA methylation in the child, which then changes their disease risk. So I'd like to show you a few examples, starting with arguably the strongest um, risk factor uh, for uh, certainly for this uh, um, outcome during pregnancy, which is maternal smoking. Um, so we've, we've looked at this in a, in a large study with uh, six and a half thousand participants where we found that DNA methylation uh, in or close to about 3000 genes is associated with maternal smoking. So it changes in relation to maternal smoking. Now the question is of course, where in the genome are these genes and what are their functions? And if you look at that, you see that some of the functions uh, or many of the functions actually make sense if you think about what we know about the risks of maternal smoking. So they have to do with embryonic development, uh, um, oral facial clefts and lung function, for example. So we've shown that smoking is associated with DNA um, methylation in the newborn. Then um, a second very well-known exposure, of course, folic acid, um, or actually we looked at folate levels in the blood of uh, pregnant women in about 2000 women. And again, we found quite large numbers of um, of regions of the DNA or locations in the DNA where DNA methylation is changed. And again, we can see that the functions that these genes have make sense um, in terms of being associated with neural tube defects, neurodevelopment and growth. So again, we see a prenatal factor associated with, uh, with changes in DNA methylation. Um, then a, an exposure that Margarita and I are particularly interested in, uh, maternal body mass index and obesity and diabetes. Um, first, zooming into the right side of the slide where you can see the results for, um, for gestational diabetes, where we do see that there are some changes in DNA methylation, not as huge as you saw, saw for smoking or folate, but uh, still some changes. And on the left, you can see um, that for maternal obesity, we found that that's associated with DNA methylation, about 80 sites. Now, of course, the key question is, these associations are great, but what we're really after is figuring out the biological pathway. So is it indeed the case, not only that maternal obesity occurs together with DNA methylation, but that maternal obesity may actually cause DNA methylation changes, which then lead to or cause an increased um, disease risk. And basically the answer to that is sometimes yes and sometimes no, as far as we can say now. So we, can, we did some analyses and showed that uh, for some of the uh, sites, there was actually a causal effect for others, maybe not. So there may be various explanations, but we do see that there is the start of a causal pathway there going from obesity uh, affecting um, uh, DNA methylation. Now, of course, the next question is, can you actually link change in DNA methylation to health outcomes? Because that's what we're after, figuring out how this increased disease risk um, occurs. Um, we did look at that for, uh, I'll show you two, um, two examples. The first one is for birth weight, um, where again we did a large meta-analysis, and this is actually in fact maybe good to highlight that this type of work where we put many studies together and combine our data to run analyses in large sample sizes would not be possible without the support of uh, organizations such as JPI, HCHL, as well as, uh, for example, other um, Horizon projects. Um, we found quite a lot of changes in DNA methylation uh, in relation to birth weight. 
that in itself is interesting. But for me, the more interesting part of that study was that there was actually an overlap between the regions that were changed in relation to maternal smoking and those that were changed in relation to birth weight. Similarly, for, for maternal BMI. So potentially, we're looking here at a pathway that leads from smoking or BMI to changes in DNA methylation, to changes in birth weight. Um, that has not been proven yet, I have to say. It's some, something that we're currently working on to get more insight into that. So this is very much the first step um, in, a, in this field to try and figure out how this all works. And finally, I put this in because, again, it's one of our favorite phenotypes, body mass index in, in uh, children. And also because it's interesting because we, we looked at whether DNA methylation changes at birth were associated with obesity in children. And in fact, there was not that much there. Um, there didn't seem to be, there were a few, few findings, but not hugely. However, um, in adults, we see that there's quite a strong association of DNA methylation and, uh, and obesity. So what we're thinking now is that it may be the case that it's not like DNA methylation causing obesity, but maybe obesity causes DNA methylation. And the longer children are exposed, if you will, to obesity, um, the more they, they uh, acquire DNA methylation changes. And we did see that the adult pattern of DNA methylation changes came up increasingly with increasing age of the children. So this is very much a field in progress, as you can hear, and we're excited um, to, to work on this and, and figure out more about these pathways and, and, and very much also about the causality, because that will help us in targeting these pathways for prevention and treatment of, um, of, of many of the non-communicable diseases. So I have already spoken too long, I can see, which is, was a risk, as I said in the beginning, uh, but we're still within the time for the session. Um, wrapping this up, we would like to uh, share some thoughts about um, um, future steps, and I will give the floor back to Marguerite. So what's the next step? Uh, we have been really discussing quite a bit with Janine and others that what should we be doing? And uh, what has become very evident is that these analyses and these works are very complicated, very difficult. And the direction of uh, causality, for example, is not that straightforward an association of themselves. So what we think, what should, be, uh, be, what should we be doing next is that we have to have the data at more refined level, at at more refined molecular level, we would need uh, the, the instruments to collect the data, new instruments to get the observational data as well, better ways of collecting, at, also at more refined level, and uh, and use the technologies. Then we will need uh, to develop applications, which is which are on their way to uh, have a more uh, kind of non-invasive ways of of measuring uh, measuring uh, people's metabolism metabolic health and so on then what is extremely important is that we have to actually be able and target to translate the scientific information into clinical practice and people's good and well-being and that uh, that uh, society also uh, gets the best out of these works and what uh, we have been thinking as a group and i've been thinking by myself is that we are not doing the things in right ways yet we need a, a, a population level screenings even we will need uh, information early enough about the risk factors that we don't end up with a situation that in early ages people are seriously Ill, having myocardial infarctions and so on and maybe in the future, and we need actually multidisciplinary works and networks and connections uh, with uh, non-scientific uh, 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 fields as well. And maybe in the future, there we would need some better tailored nutrition and maybe kind of um, functional foods, maybe drip in our lines and so on, so <laughs> weight and so on, and be fed in different ways. But anyway, so um, thank you so much. So uh, we have a lot, we have a lot to do and to go for. Yes, thank you very much, Margarita. Of course, uh, we're, we're not doing this on our own. Um, we have a lot of people in our teams and in other institutes. Some of them are here today. So many thanks to all of our collaborators in the projects, and of course, to JPI HDHL for, for funding. Um, let me see, um, Vilka, I can see the chat. Um, there are some questions. Yes. So, Shall I just, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, 
we have time i think for uh, a couple yes. of questions yeah so maybe you can pick out uh, yeah. uh, two or three and uh, answer briefly yeah sure so so i see that there are two questions asking about whether um, DNA methylation can be changed by interventions. Um, the answer to that is in principle, yes. So DNA methylation is dynamic and it can change. Um, there are some smaller studies um, that are looking into, for example, uh, Jeanne, I saw that you were asking about physical activity. Um, so uh, there are uh, smaller studies looking into the effect of physical activity interventions on DNA methylation, as well as things like um, fish uh, oil supplementation in pregnancy has been done. Um, so there are some studies going on in that. I think currently um, there's a lot for us to learn yet, but in principle, DNA methylation is um, can be changed or um, can be, uh, you know, um, can be reversed or if you will. Um, Margarita, jump in if you if you'd like to add um if not then i will go to ah this is yeah have you had the opportunity to examine the role of the father smoking bmi etc in relation to offspring epigenetic changes that's a very interesting question thank you for that and um so we have done that for several things in particular bmi is one of the uh one of the things that we have actually looked at that in detail and we 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 hardly see any effects of paternal bmi on the offspring epigenome um, so, um, uh, the maternal effects are clearly much stronger than the paternal effect, if there are any, and, and quite frankly, from the last work that we've done, there were, if I remember correctly, no, uh, or only very minimal changes. So there seems to be, um, that seems to indicate that there is a direct effect from maternal obesity or maybe also other phenotypes onto uh, the developing uh, fetus. Um, and, and not so much, at least, through effects on uh, on the sperm, for example. Marjorie, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think this was a very good explanation. Yes, okay. there, is, there are research which are really looking at intergenerational uh, changes, and uh, this is what we what we are seeing at the moment. So, so um, it's very yeah. important from generation to another to uh, try to look at in a kind of a long kind of a continuum and uh, that uh, what can we do now what what good can we do for the next generations during our lifetime as researchers yeah it's a, it's a very interesting puzzle to figure out and margarita you've done a lot of work on this uh, you know figuring out because of course you know children get half of their genome and their genetic variation from from their mother and the other half from the father. So genetic variants also uh, affect DNA methylation. So if you see DNA mm -hmm. methylation changes, you need to be very careful that um, um, you know you disentangle genetic effects from environmental effects or maybe combined effects from ge genetic and environmental effects. So um, actually it's something that we're currently working on to try and, and, and put them all into the same and say which is really the largest effect. So far, um, uh, seems to be a quite a strong um, genetic and also combined genetic and environmental um, effect. I think we're at the hour. Wilco, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, um, I think we can now end the session. Uh, Janine and Marjorie, thank you very much for this interesting uh, talk. Uh, it's very nice to hear about projects and also about the importance of this uh, research field. Um, you will receive also a little uh, thank you present from the GPR HCHL and it will be sent at your home address. That's so nice. Um, yeah. Thank you. The audience, I think that you can now leave the session and then we will have a, a, a closing session in the lobby uh, for Martijn de Bakker for today. So you can just leave the session and then go to the lobby and then uh, we will go to the final part of the program. Thank you very much. And, Great. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, Marjorie, go on. No, no, I was thanking everybody <laughs> coming along. Yes, for me as well. And if there are any remaining questions, um, uh, we didn't put our emails, but they're, they're, you can find them on the internet. Feel free to email us with any yeah. questions. questions. You Thanks. can also send it to the GPI, and I will uh, also send the questions uh, to uh, Janine and uh, Marjorie. Da. Great. Thanks a lot for your interest. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You. Bye. <laughs>
go out? What is the you way? Have to, <laughs> you have to press leave at the top right hand corner. That'll take you to the lobby, I think. Yeah, it's leave. Yes, I can see because my screen is just hiding it.